Implantation and the two-week wait. How to know if you could be pregnant as early as possible. Hi friends, I'm talking about implantation and how soon can you know if you're pregnant and what are the signs? I am Natalie Crawford, MD. I am a fertility physician in Austin, Texas, and this channel exists to provide you fertility facts and education so you can be empowered about your reproductive health. Go ahead and subscribe if these things are of interest to you and support the channel even more. Today, I want to dive in to implantation because I get asked this question all the time. And even when I was trying to get pregnant, I took so many pregnancy tests and I Googled every symptom and I just wanted to know so badly if I was pregnant as soon as I could, especially after suffering through multiple losses, having that information earlier felt very empowering, but there's a lot we don't understand about implantation. So let's start at the very beginning. Let's remember how ovulation occurs because this is important. So imagine in your ovary, there's a vault where all your eggs are kept. At the beginning of the month, a group of eggs comes out of the vault. Each egg grows inside a follicle. The brain sends out FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates one of these follicles to grow, therefore letting the egg mature inside. The brain then gives an LH surge, which is what you can detect with an ovulation predictor kit, and then you can ovulate. After you ovulate, the egg is captured by the fallopian tube. The ovary and the fallopian tube are actually separate, so the egg has to travel and get sucked into the fallopian tube. When it enters into the fallopian tube, it lives for about 24 hours and then fertilization occurs. So fertilization occurs inside the fallopian tube. That is where we first have an embryo. So an egg is just the egg is released from the ovary, contains female genetics. An embryo is a combination of female male genetics and that's your new life. The embryo then has to migrate through the fallopian tube and enter into the uterus. As it does this, it is transitioning through different stages of development. So it turns on day three into about an eight to 10 cell, little morula, and then it develops even further as it enters into the uterus on day five or six as what we call a blastocyst. A blastocyst is an expanded embryo. It's 200 or more cells. It has outer cells that are all the placenta or the trophectoderm, and it has inner cells that are the inner cell mass or it becomes the baby. So those first few days after ovulation, there's nothing to implant. The embryo is not even in the uterus. So some semantics. People will say DPO days post ovulation. This is common in infertility speak. So if you are five or six DPO, your embryo, a blastocyst, is just entering into the uterine cavity. There, it will start to implant around day seven to nine. Because ovulation isn't always perfectly known, you'll often see a range of days five to nine. But for the most part, if we know we put that embryo in, we know when implantation is going to occur. Side note, when we do an embryo transfer in IVF cycles, we are taking the eggs out of the body, fertilizing them in the lab, and then putting an embryo back in. We can put an embryo inside on day three. Now remember, we're putting an embryo inside the uterus, and on day three, an embryo should still be in the fallopian tube. So it has to hang out in the uterus a little while before it can implant on that day seven to nine. Or more commonly now, we can put an embryo inside on day five, which you can see is the day when an embryo should be transitioning into the uterine cavity and implantation occurring soon thereafter. So in natural cycles or cycles without IVF, where your egg grew, matured, and ovulated from a follicle, that follicle becomes the corpus luteum. And immediately after ovulation, it starts making progesterone. It makes progesterone in pulses stimulated from the brain from LH. So your progesterone is going up and down. But that progesterone is essential to support a pregnancy. It actually transitions the uterine lining, that lining inside the uterus, so an embryo can come and stick there. Without progesterone, an embryo cannot implant, period, the end. We know this from studies where if you took an ovary out of a monkey, it would not have a pregnancy implant or it would lose a pregnancy. That corpus luteum also has to function until the placenta starts making progesterone itself. So when you look at the hormone pattern in a normal cycle, in your early cycle, you'll have a rise of estrogen as the egg is becoming more mature. After ovulation, you'll start having progesterone production made in pulses, but there is no HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, 
until a pregnancy implants. And that's what pregnancy tests check. So your ovulation kits check LH, your pregnancy tests check HCG. HCG is made by the embryo. Its whole job is to stimulate that corpus luteum to make progesterone also. So it takes over for the brain. We call this being rescued by the pregnancy. So the corpus luteum normally will die off after about two weeks if there's no HCG around. That's just how long it can live. However, if a pregnancy starts to implant, HCG will then start to stimulate the progesterone production. And we see it start to rise more because HCG is not released in pulses. It's more of a steady release. So now we see a rise in progesterone. This is important because this controls some of our symptoms. So the HCG and that huge burst of progesterone, which starts to rise once implantation happens. So you have a little bit of a rise after ovulation. So everybody starts to feel some high progesterone symptoms after ovulation. However, if you get pregnant, very often you start to feel extra symptoms as you enter into that late luteal phase or after day seven to nine post ovulation when that HCG starts rises. So what are the symptoms? So you can have breast tenderness and breast enlargement. So you can also be nauseous or food sensitive or very sensitive to smells. You may have changes in your appetite or start to get grossed out by certain foods. We also tend to see bowel changes. So progesterone often can cause constipation and bloating. Fatigue is a huge symptom of high progesterone. And anybody who's been pregnant will tell you that. And I will tell you that for myself. And some women also complain of headaches or mood changes. Those are all progesterone related signs and symptoms that you may see. Now, remember, this can be really hard to distinguish from both the luteal phase where you just have elevated progesterone naturally. Some people are very sensitive to that or if you're taking progesterone treatments because a fertility doctor gave them to you for the luteal phase. So these can be really hard to say, are these symptoms just normal or are they pregnancy symptoms? Now, as that embryo implants, what is implantation? The human body is fascinating. Okay, think about what implantation really is. Those symptoms are all from progesterone. So that's a hormonal elevation from HCG. But how does HCG get into the bloodstream? An embryo literally eats into your uterine wall and starts to implant. I mean, that's the nicest way that I can say it. So an embryo is captured in that endometrial fluffy layer of the uterus, and then it secretes enzymes that allows that to start growing in to the maternal vasculature. And that's what the placenta is. The placenta is the most fascinating organ in the human body. You can't argue with me otherwise. The placenta integrates the fetal blood supply with maternal and you get these locking blood vessels. And how does it do that? That doesn't happen without some discomfort or pain or cramping and they can be pretty severe or even sometimes bleeding or spotting because you're eating into that uterine wall trying to make that attachment. And so very often women will have implantation or that mid luteal spotting or cramping. So starting around those days seven to nine, potentially progressing as that embryo is growing in. So bleeding, spotting, nausea, appetite changes, breast tenderness or swelling, bloating, constipation, headaches, and mood swings. And then some people feel nothing at all. They never get implantation symptoms. They don't feel a thing. I always had an extreme increase in my sense of smell. So anytime I was pregnant, even with my losses, suddenly before I ever took a pregnancy test, I could smell like everything. And this brings up another question, and that is, how early can you take a pregnancy test? Now just think about a pregnancy test. Everyone has a different level of HCG that it can detect. It's about how the test is made, how much you spend for it. But essentially, HCG should double approximately every two days. So it's rising throughout an early pregnancy. So you're not going to get a positive before implantation begins because there's no HCG in the bloodstream, even if fertilization has occurred. So typically we say the very earliest you're going to get a positive is going to be around day eight to nine post ovulation. So I don't recommend testing prior to that because you're going to be wasting your money. Other important facts is that if you're doing fertility treatments and use a trigger shot, a trigger shot is an HCG shot. It forces your body to ovulate, so it induces an LH surge. I know that's confusing because these are two separate hormones, but the take home message is that it will stay in your blood. So if you're doing an IUI cycle and you use a trigger shot, and then you take a pregnancy test five days later, it'll be positive because that trigger is still in your body. Some people do not recommend, do not recommend 
test out their trigger. So that's actually when you take a pregnancy test every day after you use your trigger shot and you watch the line come down and then you can watch it go back up. So if you know when ovulation happens, the earliest you could take a pregnancy test would be around day eight or nine post ovulation. Waiting later is better. If you test really early with highly sensitive tests, you may catch chemical pregnancies, but it also may cause some emotional heartbreak. So there's an older but very famous study called The Incidence of Early Pregnancy Loss by Wilcox et al. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they followed women with a highly sensitive urine test every single day of their cycle and checked for pregnancy. 22% of these happened before the woman even missed her period. So her HCG went up and came back down, early chemical loss, woman had no idea. The human body is very selective and picky about which pregnancies it allows to carry on. It wants to make sure that the pregnancy has the full potential. Humans can't be pregnant multiple times, but also should tell you that if you have a loss, you're not alone. Last thing to know, and this is confusing, is why is pregnancy 40 weeks? The reason why is that before we knew when implantation happened, we had any of this data, or we had ultrasound to date pregnancies. What we did is we went by a woman's last menstrual period. That's the only time we had a marker for. So if you typically ovulate around the two week mark, if you have average four week length cycles, then what we would say is from the last period, you'd add two weeks on. So for example, when you ovulate, you're two weeks pregnant. I know that's crazy because you're not really pregnant. Also, when we do IVF and we put in a day five embryo, you're two weeks and five days pregnant. So your actual gestational age and the embryonic age are different really. Like an embryo is only two weeks old when you're four weeks gestationally pregnant. That's okay to just keep things consistent throughout time. That's what we do. But it's important to know that if your periods are really irregular, your doctor may date you by that LMP, that last menstrual period, and that may not actually be accurate, and then you may get your dates changed later. So if you know when you had ovulation, if you saw a fertility doctor, did treatment or were testing, always tell your doctor, this was my ovulation date, because that's a more accurate representation of when fertilization and implantation occurred and how pregnant you actually are. Thanks friends so much for watching. Would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Bye.